pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, whose name is Waverly Ray. And uh, she uh, has uh, just been hired uh, here at Mesa, so we are very happy to have her as a new faculty member. And uh, she, uh, her uh, professional history includes uh, having done dissertation research in China and Chile, and she has an international geography education. And she's also a uh, um, faculty member for a brand new student club uh, for environmental sustainability and conservation. And uh, this may be her first time speaking for our social uh, science education lectures as a professor, but it is not her first time as a speaker. She was a guest speaker in 2007 when she was an adjunct here at Mesa. And uh, so it is my great pleasure to welcome back. Well, good afternoon. Thank you uh, so much. How are you guys doing this afternoon? Good, how are you? Doing fine, thank you. It's nice to see some familiar and unfamiliar faces. Um, so the thought of me giving a two-hour lecture makes me want to um, pluck out all my eyebrows, let's say. Uh, so let's try to make this as interactive as possible uh, as we go through. So if you have any questions or comments, I would love for you to um, share them with me. And um, if you want a, a copy of the presentation with any of the citations, just go ahead and email me and I'd be happy to, to get that to you. All right, so should we get started? Are we ready? Uh, this is going to be like a world tour. I hope you guys pack for all kinds of weather because we're really going to hit a lot of places today. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about cardophilia in the digital age. Um, what is cardophilia? What does that word mean? Is it something about maps? It is something about maps. It's the love of maps. It's the love of maps, right? Is anyone um, cardiophobic here? Anyone have a fear of maps? All right, well, we might have some trouble with you. If you need to take a breath. Uh... Siri talks me through it. So. <laughs> Siri takes you through it. Cool. So, um, yeah, so we're going to talk about this love of maps and what, what it means in the, in the digital age. And I'm trying to draw on um, how geographers would look at uh, information in different disciplines. So I've tried to select from d disciplines across campus to see, you know, how this geographic way of thought m merges with whatever your field of study is. Um, and so for the quick, quick outline, uh, we're going to look at, um, doing a warm-up just to get us in that geographic mindset. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about cardophilia and some implications of that. Um, I'm going to talk about the digital earth and so the, the amazing amount of data we have now today uh, about our planet. Uh, I'll talk about community mapping projects. Um, I'll give you some map sources. It always, I always shed a small tear whenever I see uh, a student carrying around a map that's been like, you know, it's 60 years old and it's been reproduced 10 times, right? So I'll give you some sources if you're looking for good outline maps or good online maps. Um, and then we'll take a departure point um, from this. I don't mean this to be a conclusion at the end, but maybe the, uh, a departure, departure point for a new journey that we're going to think about um, with the ideas that I present. We'll see if that works. Um, so for the warm-up, um, I want you to sketch a mental map of the city of San Diego. Uh, but basically a mental map are these images that we carry around in our heads. So if you were to stop right now like, and think about picture, how would you get from here to home? Right? That's your mental map. And so I just want to take a few minutes um, for you guys to sketch it. Um, you can include as much or as little of San Diego as you want to. For those of you who um, humored me, which I appreciate, um, uh, how's that? What was that process like draw, drawing a mental map? Fine. I'm hearing a. I'm seeing a shaking head. Um, who said fine? fine? Oh, you said fun. Geography um, person back there. Um, anyone else think it was a fun thing to do? All right. So think about maybe geography as a minor, guys. If, if you're not geography <laughs> majors already. Um, and what was fun about it? It's just different. Something different. Yeah, how many of you have tried to draw a map of where we live? Okay, so not too many, right? How many of you rely on what's in your phone, that geotechnology, to help you get where you're going? And so geographers are you know, interested in um, people's mental maps because this is, uh, when someone draws their mental map, we can understand what, what they find important or maybe what they are fearful of, right? Um, how many of you had freeways on your mental map? Right, so that's not a big surprise in Southern California, right? Those are gonna feature prominently. Uh, what about the blank spaces? What do the blank spaces represent? Is there, is there nothing where you didn't draw something? Is there something there? Go ahead. No, mine's like a, um, like a tunnel. You know? Uh -huh. I don't care about the right space. Uh -huh. 
hyper focused. So what's going on in other? It's just your your pathway is what's most important. Okay. Did you have a comment? Well, I, I started from the bottom, and I just um, I started from the border, and I only made up the eight freeway, and then I had all the way to Oceanside to go at least. Okay. So the the scale of it. How many of you had the international border drawn on? I guess I'll say how many did not have that border. Right, so that's pretty interesting considering we're, we are an international town, right? How many people uh, where that border even comes up in their mental map? Um, and so that's interesting for a geographer too. And so the idea here is what I'm going to be talking about today, it's something that humans as species uh, have ingrained um, in our heads, right? Or these spatial thinking skills. Whether or not we, we've used that tool very much, it's all in our brains. It's something that's an innate in all of us. So let's think about that. Um, and then so why cardophilia? Well, I feel like as a geographer, uh, I get told two things when I tell people I'm a geographer, right? Number one, oh, when I was in sixth grade or ninth grade or whatever grade, I memorized all the capitals and countries in the world, right? And of course, those of you who've taken geography know that geography is not just that. That's the baseline knowledge. You have to know where things are located. But we're way more interested in the interconnections between people and places, right? Between economic, cultural, and physical systems, right? And so uh, I, get to, I get told that. And the second most common thing is this. I love maps. Does anyone here like, like to look at maps? You can admit it. We're a friendly audience, right? And so people are, are, uh, love seeing these maps, maybe looking at places that we've never been and will never go, right? But this cardophilia, this love of maps, is like loving someone who lies and cheats. Have you guys ever loved someone who's a liar and a cheater? <laughs> Yeah, and so it's, it's true though, right? And it, it, it is, and, and, and so here um, uh, from the book, How to Lie with Maps, Mark Lemonnier, uh, not only is it easy to lie with maps, it's essential. And so why is that? Why is it essential? Yes? Maybe because you can't present every possible like nuance of a landscape in a single like template. Exactly. So, yeah, so we talked, I, t I mentioned earlier to, to somebody that, you know, a map is an overhead view um, of the earth that's reduced in size. And in that process, right, we can't possibly have every detail of the earth there, right? So that's one reason. Is there another reason? Yeah. It's uh, for practicality. Sometimes uh, people don't need all the other information, like, a, like an overlay. You just need to know, okay, here's all, here's all my dairy farms. I just need to visit these guys. Yeah, so you kind of pick, and who decides what it is that's put on a map? The map maker, the cartographer, right? So they're making a lot of decisions in what's portrayed in the map. And, and one thing, the, probably the biggest reason why all maps are lies as well, is that you can't take this 3D spheroid of an Earth and flatten it out. What's going to happen if I try to flatten this globe out? It's going to tear, right? You can't peel an orange and have it be uh, totally flat without ripping it, right? So it's the same concept here, right? We can't take this 3D spheroid of an Earth and flatten it out into a 2D surface of a map without having tears or distortion there. Um, so that's another reason why maps are liars and cheaters. But there's more um, that I want to talk about. So um, let's just look at a couple maps, um, see, how, see, how we, see what we think of them. Uh, what's wrong with this map? <laughs> Is there something wrong with it? All right, well, it's, it's upside down, right? But we've been normalized to see the earth in one way. But there's nothing that says the way that we've, been, we've uh, seen it all our lives is the, is the right way. There's no right way, right? It's just what we've been normalized. It's just uh, because of our history, uh, the maps that, that we have. Um, what about this one? What's wrong with this one? And so this one's coming from um, 1666. Well, it accurately portrays California's map. Yeah, this is right, obviously very <laughs> accurate, right, it's showing California as an island. Okay, so, you know, obviously this is dated information, but it's also kind of showing the bias of the map maker, right? Did people living in California in 1666 when this map was made, did they think California was an island? No. No, they, they sure knew that they weren't living on an island, right? Now, people have been living here for thousands of years at that point. Uh, and so we have to think about the, the bias that is conveyed from the map maker, whether it's intentional or, or maybe unintentional, right? So we need to, be, to, to think about that. Um, what about this one? And if you can't see it in the back, we're looking at North Korea's missile threat. This is from The Economist magazine. Um, and so it's highlighting North Korea in the center of the circle. Um, and then it's showing us the range of different types of missiles um, that are either uh, at this point 
uh, um, more than 10 years ago now, um, were either um, fully developed or in production. Uh, what's wrong with this map? The distances are wrong because uh, what they've done is they've taken a certain type of map projection, right, a certain um, a classification of map, and they have assumed that you can um, circle, you can measure distances around a point, and those distances are accurate. And so they made a false assumption. Uh, and so they, uh, the Economist <coughs> magazine. Have you guys heard of the Economist magazine? Yes. Would you say it's pretty well um, re um, has good reputation? Would you say that? I guess it depends on who I ask. But uh, this is the, actually the reprint that they had to do because um, they realized their error. So, you know, this map is showing um, California, San Diego outside of missile range. What about the map on the right? Are we within missile range? Right? So we can also see distortions in the map, not only from the bias of the map maker, but also um, the errors that the map maker might have. And, a lot of places that have graphic designers um, who make maps, right, they don't have these geographic thinking skills, right? And so we always have to be critical of what we're seeing. Um, what about this map? Um, here, notice the, the size of Greenland in the uh, very upper right of the map um, to the size of Africa. Um, right, and so this is um, a, a huge distortion and even um, people's perceptions of Africa are often um, making it think that that continent is smaller than it really is. Have you guys ever seen a map like this where we, we in place other countries into Africa? It's funny because there's a couple out there that had made the same mistake as The Economist magazine where they picked a map where you can't compare areas and then they put the sizes together. This happens to be one also from The Economist, but this was put, published later, and I think they, their cartography department expanded since the, their original era. And so we have all these reasons why maps are liars and cheaters, right? There's bias, um, just the, the simple fact that we can't take a 3D to a 2D, uh, and also we're simplifying <coughs> the information. The cartographer is making decisions on what to include or exclude. Um, and so let's look at this, um, if I can get this to play. Hi, I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry to be late. Not a problem. I'm CJ Craig. Of course you are. I'm Dr. John Fallow. This is Dr. Cynthia Sales and uh, Professor Donald Huke. Huke? Huke. Okay. And you are the Organization of Cartographers for Social Equality. Well, we're, uh, we're from the OCSE. We have many members. How many? 4,300 dues-paying members. What are the dues? Uh, $20 a year for the newsletter. Let's start. Wait. Wait. I want to see this. This is Josh Lyman. Indeed you are. Josh, this is Dr. Fallow, and Hi. who's Mary Men. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Should we begin? Yes. Plain and simple, uh, we'd like President Bartlett to aggressively support legislation that would make it mandatory for every public school in America to teach geography using the Peters projection map instead of the traditional Mercator. Give me 200 bucks and it's done. Really? No. Why are we changing maps? Uh, because, CJ, the Mercator projection has fostered European imperialist attitudes for centuries and created an ethnic bias against the Third World. Really? The German cartographer, Mercator, originally designed this map in 1569 as a navigational tool for European sailors. The map enlarges areas at the poles to create straight lines of constant bearing or geographic direction. So it makes it easier to cross an ocean. But. Yes. It distorts the relative size of nations and continents. Are you saying the map is wrong? Oh dear, yes. Uh, look at Greenland. Okay. Now look at Africa. Okay. The two land masses appear to be roughly the same size. Yes. Would it blow your mind if I told you that Africa is in reality 14 times larger? Yes. Here we have Europe drawn considerably larger than South America when it's 6.9 million square miles, South America is almost double the size of Europe's 3.8 million. Alaska appears three times as large as Mexico when Mexico is larger by 0.1 million square miles. Germany appears in the middle of the map when it's in the northernmost quarter of the Earth. Wait, wait, relative size is one thing, but you're telling me that Germany isn't where we think it is? Nothing's where you think it is. Where is it? I'm glad you asked. The Peters projection. It has fidelity of axis. Fidelity of position. East-west lines are parallel and intersect north-south axes at right angles. What the hell is that? 
It's where you've been living this whole time. Should we continue? Uh-huh. So, you're probably wondering what all of this has to do with social equality. No, I'm wondering where France really is. Guys, we want to thank you very much for coming in. Hang on, we're going to finish this. Okay. What do maps have to do with social equality, you ask? She asked. Salvatore Natoli of the National Council for Social Studies argues, in our society, we unconsciously equate size with importance and even power. I'm going to check in on Tommy. Go. These guys find Brigadoon on that map, you'll call me, right? Probably not. Okay. When third world countries are misrepresented, they're likely to be valued less. When Mercator maps exaggerate the importance of Western civilization, when the top of the map is given to the Northern Hemisphere and the bottom is given to the Southern, then people will tend to adopt top and bottom attitudes. But wait, how... where else could you put the Northern Hemisphere but on the top? On the bottom. How? Like this. Yeah, but you can't do that. Why not? Because it's freaking me out. Um, so any thoughts on that? Um, do you think, does size matter? Definitely. It's funny, this is a total aside that's off color, but I saw Kurt Vonnegut speak and when I was in high school. He was speaking at a college, and the first question he opened his talk with was, <laughs> does penis size really matter? I'm going to tell you. Um, so that, capt that captivated me as a youngster, and um, uh, yeah, so I think size does matter, right? And so, but, but it's the question, does it matter that this map, this is a Mercator map, um, does it matter that this is shown in classrooms? Does it matter that we've been normalized to see this, the world this way? Yes. Yeah. Why? Because um, as humans, we, you're saying that, that we, we tend to, well, even in there they say that, that we tend to naturally value bigger and better <coughs> just our human nature to do that and then in the video too they were promoting the pewter's projection but is that a perfect map is that a perfect representation no, no. so it has a, a other distortions so maybe we just need to learn that any map as a representation is going to have some flaws and maybe if we just acknowledge that and then um, our judgments can be better um, after it Okay, so basically I want to tell you that maps are a social construction. And so when I say that, what does that mean to you, a social construction? Okay. It represents the values and even perceptions, perhaps more than values, of any given society. So it's, as a historian, I think it's specific to both place and time. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you have a historical map up there mm -hmm. uh, supports that. Mm -hmm. Did you want to, thank you, did you want to add? Well, I just heard in the video that Mercator, Mercator, he, um, he, he, he showed the value of, of that part of the hemisphere by creating that map that, that made, made that part seem more, more relevant. Mm -hmm. the same thing that he said, but based on, the, on what I saw in the video. Mm -hmm. Right, and so this map even, um, which is um, printed in um, 1507, I'm going to say it's the Waldesi Mueller map, but I'm not a German speaker. Um, 1507, it was printed in a volume called Intro to Cosmography, right? So people were trying to understand um, humans' place in the greater um, universe. And um, this is uh, what we came out with. Um, and from an article in the Smithsonian that I was reading, um, you know, they talk about cosmography for Europeans in 1507 was um, geocentric. They thought that the sun and everything else revolved around the earth, right? And so this was a map that was produced uh, during that time. Of course, uh, we can look at scholars in India and in the Islamic world where the heliocentric or the, where the sun is at the center of the universe, uh, hundreds of years earlier, they had already been aware of that. Um, but this map is the first, one of the first, I hate to say first in geography, because first of all, I'm not a historian, but also because um, we're limited to, to really find the, what the first is. Uh, but I'll say this is one of the first maps to actually label um, America as America. Uh, and so it was this in this like obscure volume that was published. And um, I thought it was interesting uh, to point this out, so I'll just quote from, from the translation. Uh, since both Asia and Africa received their names from women, I do not see why anyone should rightly prevent this new part from being called Amerigen, 
the land of Amerigo, as it were, or America, after its discoverer, Americus, a man of perceptive character. And so even, you think about maps as a social construction, even the name that we're given to our country, how many of you guys are proud to be an American? Right? How, how many of you guys think about wh why are we called that? Like, where did that come from? And um, this suggests that it came uh, from a map. But the idea here is that, um, you know, choosing what is map, choosing the languages that we use to, in the map, right, you're conveying a, a, an ideology. You're conveying your bias. And um, geographers read maps like texts. And in the Common Core, they're talking about maps as text, right? Just so like you can read a novel or a poem, you can read a map in, in the same way. It's going to tell you the same, you can ask the same sorts of uh, rhetorical questions of a map. And so because it's a Women's History Month, I thought I'd just try to apply um, sort of uh, more uh, postmodern or maybe even post-postmodern ideas, uh, depending where you stand um, into this when we're critiquing maps, right? So one would be a feminist perspective um, that, want to that wants to focus on the lived experiences of people, right? So not just uh, men or women, not a gender binary, but thinking about genders as a whole, uh, thinking about classes and races, how are those lived experiences different uh, than others? Um, they also take a critical standpoint, right? So a feminist researcher would look at that map as text and say, uh, what were the powers and privileges of the map maker or the people who used the map? Uh, and how did that uh, influence what was mapped and how it was used and what decisions were made from it? Uh, so that's sort of one strand to think about. Um, and another one is post-colonial. Um, and for geography, this is really important because geography was a tool of, um, uh, and still is today, it's the tool of warfare, right? That was sort of why you needed to know geography early on, right? It was either... Um, um, to uh, prepare yourselves in battle, right? All of our geotechnologies come from military applications first, right? And so we, th we should think about that. Um, and so w one idea with post-colonial is that Western is not equated to superior. Are you guys, anyone surprised to hear that? Western is not superior? It's interesting, I get surprised in my classes because I feel like every semester I'll have someone, a student write about an uncivilized population. And it really perplexes me, like, who, who is not civilized when we're talking about the societies that we look at in my class anyway? Um, and so I think this is still a strand, this is still a bias, and, and perhaps it's coming from these maps that we've created and that we've been normalized to see. Um, and then also, with this post-colonial um, ideology, we're thinking about, you know, how we imagine the other, right? Do you guys hear people talk about the Orients or the Oriental? Right? So that was an imagination of uh, Western Europe. Um, uh, even the fact that um, if we go west, what, where do we go? We go to the east, right, from the Americas. The, the east compared to who? Not to us, right? It, we're, we're centralizing our viewpoint um, to Western Europe. And as a, an American geographer, we need to be, I need to be a, aware of that, right? The, the, the frame that I'm looking at is very much an American view. And how we view others in the world um, is, is sort of tainted by these um, uh, colonial practices that happened in the past. Uh, and that was certainly my experience when I went to places like China or Chile or Tunisia or India or Japan. And when I worked with uh, geographers there, right, it became apparent that we have a very uh, focused uh, point of view that we need to disrupt. So uh, we're going to take a couple of detours um, today, kind of quick ones. Uh, but number one a detour, I just want to ask some questions, right? So how are maps used in your discipline? Um, and then uh, the second question I want to think about is how does your discipline intersect with social justice? Because I, ultimately, I think this idea of cartophilia and the using of maps is rooted in issues of social justice. Um, do you guys have a good definition of social justice? Raise your hand if social justice is a topic that you've heard in a class. All right, well, I'm going to read one quote that I happen to like um, from, about social justice, and it's coming from um, the uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner. So this is in Australia some decades ago. It says, social justice is what faces you in the morning. It is awakening in a house with adequate water supply, cooking facilities, and sanita sanitation. It is the ability to nourish your children and send them to school where their education not only equips them for employment, but reinforces their knowledge and understanding of their cultural inheritance. It is the prospect of genuine employment and good health, a life of choices and opportunity, free from discrimination. 
And so the question becomes if geography um, is using maps and it, um, if we're not critical, if we don't take these feminist post-colonial perspectives of these maps, right, are we just perpetuating the status quo? Um, and I think uh, when we're critical of these maps and geography, right, we can work towards social justice. Um, but that's just a hypothesis. What about, but what about in your discipline from your point of view? Right, geographers are under, interested in other people's perspectives as much as our own. Um, so how are maps are used in your discipline? In every discipline that I heard you guys tell me, maps are in use. Should I wait or sh should I be more stubborn? Thank you for participating. Um, I would say like two ways. Because one, one of my teachers, like she YouTube a video, um, and the map that the guy was creating was maps like in inner cities of where things need to be fixed. But I guess in my own right of maybe traffic, like okay, I have two routes, uh, so you know maps that way of trying to take with my shortest distance. Mm -hmm. um, Grocery shopping, anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So like uh, route finding. Right. Uh huh. Any other ways? I think everyone who's added a history class has been told to buy a historical atlas. Buy a historical atlas. This is what the borders, the boundaries, the territories <coughs> look like over time. Although, again, as you pointed out, they're absurdly reductionist, but. The reductionist rate, and then also, but that's important, right? The historical maps are important because those boundaries are made up too. If maps are socially constructed, certainly boundaries are as well, and those political borders, right? And we can see, you know, the shifting border between uh, present-day United States and Mexico, how that's changed over time as well. What about this idea of social justice? Do you think that resonates in your disciplines? Yes. I was just going to mention regarding the, the first question. Um, Although it's a useful distinction, it still is a bit messy. In my field, there's Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy, yeah, <laughs> right, which is very we've, tricky. We've classified <laughs> no it. No Northeastern or Southwestern philosophy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when it comes to social justice, mm -hmm. I was kind of just thinking of like what part of San Diego do you live in? You know which boundaries are maybe um, a core part of San Diego. So you know type of social injustices mm -hmm. of knowing where the bad neighborhoods are. Mm -hmm. and, that's a, and that's that lived experience, right? Because what, what, what a neighborhood that I'll feel safe in might be different from a neighborhood that you guys feel safe in, right? Um, and so thinking about that. Um, all right, so just these are just questions that I ponder. Um, and, you know, if you want to, that's great. Um, next up, the digital earth. Okay, so where, how did we get to where we are today, right? So we've looked at some historical maps. Um, some more recent maps, but you know, where are we now? And I think um, as we go through this, like try to think like how would a post-colonial um, uh, person look at this? How would a feminist look at these ideas? So we're going to talk about geotechnologies, uh, big data, and uh, user-generated information, open source information. And so we're just going to do a quick run through because I don't know how familiar any of you are with um, these geotechnologies. So first off, remote sensing. Um, it really, uh, remote sensing is when we take a distant picture of the earth, okay? And so that could mean from um, a camera mounted to a kite or to a hot air balloon, which is what d was done initially. Uh, it could be a, a picture taken from an aircraft. Have you guys ever set, um, sit in a window of an uh, airplane and taken a photograph? Okay, the image created is a remotely sensed image. Uh, and I always like to point this out. Um, this is um, in 1903. Uh, a couple of people had the idea, let's put a, a camera on a pigeon um, and see what we get. And this was the, the resulting view. You can't really see it, but the sort of white and the bottom red are, are buildings, um, right? And so early 1900s, we started to get these kinds of pictures with Sputnik in 1957 and the arms race. Um, you know, satellite technologies really took off. We have about a thousand satellites orbiting our Earth right now that are working satellites. Um, we're also creating space junk up there because the, the life of a satellite is not very long and it's still out there orbiting uh, even after it's no longer of use. Um, but I always like to think about, you know, 1903, does that sound like a long time ago? Maybe it is, but it's really not that many generations back. And so we have this tremendous amount of data and information um, that we've never had. Humans have never had this amount of uh, data and information. 
Uh, and I also want to point out, you know, here are some of uh, NASA's um, satellites that are focused on Earth system processes, uh, right? Because I think a lot of us think of NASA like looking out into space, but a lot of what NASA does is looking back here on Earth. Uh, and I like this slide too because you see the, the red circles uh, for international collaboration. And so this idea that, you know, if we are sort of protectionist or only focus on what's going on in the United States, we're sort of going to be able to fail as a society, right? Because these scientific projects take international collaboration. So I always like to put that out. So when I talk about geotechnologies, we have GIS, right? So uh, geographic information systems. If you guys have ever used your phone to navigate to where you're going, you're essentially using a GIS. Uh, we take layers of information, inclu including remotely sensed information, uh, to make spatial analyses. And for this example, you might be trying to find um, like where you want to put your store based on where your customers are, where transportation routes are, and so on. Uh, one of the big concerns um, for this, we have all this data uh, out there, but um, it's big data and so we have some serious concerns. And so, uh, right, we have a volume of data that is just immense um, and it's growing every year. Uh, there's a huge variety of data, right, so if we're getting information from aircraft, from satellites, from on the ground, right, that's going to... Um, we're going to have to sync up that information somehow, right? So we have to try to contend with this variety of data that's out there. The geographers are most interested in how we make sure that the data that we have is actually matching that place on the planet that we're talking about. Um, and that's the veracity of the data, right? How accurate is it? Is, it, um, is, it, um, is there a margin of error that we should be aware of? And for most data, there is a margin of error, and we have to look out for that. And then finally, the velocity to do these models and predictions um, that Earth scientists are doing. Uh, we need uh, a tremendous amount of commu computing power. This is an interesting thing. So uh, here we're looking at uh, basically an earthquake that happened um, in San Jose. And um, this is a research project to um, track Twitter um, feeds uh, uh, after the earthquake. So what you're seeing here... Um, um, is um, 30 seconds uh, top middle after the earthquake, 60 seconds um, down here, 120 seconds, 180 seconds, and then 360 seconds. Uh, and so the circles um, and the darker circles are the, the higher number of um, tweets that are mentioning this earthquake that happened. And so the question is, is, um, is Twitter faster than the USGS monitoring systems to announcing these earthquakes? Do you have any ideas? Do you think from the study, what did, what did they find, do you think? Twitter's faster. Twitter is faster. And it, um, you know, Twitter, there's a lot of differences, but they found that um, on average, the USGS can report out after about a minute and a half to 20 minutes in more remote locations, where Twitter it could be 30 seconds to two minutes. And so they've created this system where um, the USGS is now using that Twitter feed um, to, to first announce what, uh, what's happening on the ground. Of course, you would still need the old way, right, to tell you like the actual epicenter and um, the, the, the magnitude of the earthquake, right? But this is an interesting sort of big data idea. Um, how do we harness all this data information that we have out there in the planet? Um, this next one is an um, uh, example from fire. I'm going to look at fire and ice today just to show you sort of a, um, a range of uh, topics that geographers might look at. So this was um, a model from um, a fire that happened in Riverside County. It was set by arson during Santa Ana winds. And several firefighters died as a result. And so here we have um, the, the fire simul simulation being created. Why would this be important to model? Yes. So you can predict the direction of future fires. So you can predict the um, predict the fu uh, future of uh, or the direction of future fires, right? We want to understand those processes. Um, so there. How is this data gathered that generated this? Uh, well, from a variety of different ways, but they'll have satellites and aircrafts um, uh, collecting <coughs> uh, different types of data uh, to so create. It wasn't them. from the fire line. It was from overhead. Right, right. But then they'll also also have um, you know um, you know field reports as well that would contribute to this. Absolutely. Um, all right. So that's one from um, fire. Let's look at ice. Now we're going to look at Arctic sea ice. Um, 
Um, so this is sea ice minimums from 1900 to 2049. Maybe I'll do this again. Nope. So you can see the white is the ice, obviously, and then we can see it diminishing. What time? Oh, did you guys happen to catch what time it diminished? What year? Can you guys see the number? Like maybe 2030 or so, what do you say? Something around there? Uh, well, this was um, a, a more updated video um, put out. Um, it's more recent. Uh, hold on a second. Let's watch that. So now we're having a wider range, 1850 to 2100. So try to keep an eye on the year where that ice diminished. <clears throat> so that, that, it got pushed further out, didn't it? Um, and so, I, I like to use this as an example because, um, you know, this is still available, this video is still out there, and they have in, in, the, in YouTube, they have the little description that there's a newer video, right, this is for archival purposes only, but as a geographer, if I just say, I'm going to write my notes um, for my classes, and if I never go back and refresh, right, I'm going to be showing a wrong information, because, and that's the nature of all of these models, um, are, and all of the information, this big data that we're getting, um, it's having a huge impact on um, geography. And so our understanding of the Earth changes, you know, year to year. I'm going to skip that. Um, I'll skip that as well. Uh, and so here, uh, here's now the, where those types of models are being created, those fire and ice models. Um, and this is why in Wyoming. It's um, a set of uh, computer systems that can exchange data at 12 gigabytes per second. Does that mean anything to anyone? doesn't mean a whole lot to me, but that sounds like a lot. Um, it can do 1.5 quadrillion calculations per second. Does that sound like a lot, 1.5 quadrillion calculations? What about 40,000 of the most state-of-the-art computers uh, networked together? Does that have a, a bearing? Did you have a comment? I have a question. Sure. Um, so from the first video that we saw of the ice changing to the second video, um, would you say that is intelligence, us just knowing the Earth a little bit better, or would you say that's individuals living in like a more resourceful manner. Yeah, it's just our scientific technology is getting better. Okay. Yeah, that's the, what that's reflecting. Um, and so, you know, that's the, those geotechnologies are out there. They're changing the way we understand and make decisions about the planet that we live on. Um, but there's also sort of user-generated um, uh, um, things going on. And so here, um, you know, what most humans did for most of their existence, right, um, looking up, right, they weren't looking down, right. Has anyone read this book? Is there Neil Hurston? Um, and so there's um, most uh, good books that are out there, um, oops, wrong one, um, uh, have these tours now, and so um, teachers, professors have gone in and um, at these different locations that are mentioned in the novel, it can embed uh, location information in there, maybe have an excerpt from the model, and then students answer a question from it. Right? So this is sort of the user-generated size. Like we, we have all these geotechnologies, uh, now we can change um, even our use of uh, those digital maps. Uh, what else do we have um, here in Malaysia? Anyone know how to pronounce that correctly? I'm certain I don't Penang. know. Penang. Okay, well that's what I was going to go for. Um, and so we have these story maps, so even what is presented um, changes. So let's see if I can pull this up. Um, and so here we're looking at street art. This is produced um, uh, by the tourist um, uh, um, Group. So even art majors, performance majors, right, you can look at cityscapes and how that impacts us. Um, I think this is probably one of my favorite ones that I've seen here. Can you guys see that? Does that, t does that mean I'm a twisted person? I just, I just, it was just a surprise when I saw it. That's all I'm going to say. Not that I like the, what it's doing, but it, I was surprised by what I saw. Um, so, you know, we're using maps in these ways to present information. We also have... Um, 
uh, you know, city reports, um, you know, uh, for UN um, aids, right? So they, they use these story maps to present information in a more friendly way. Uh, are you going to read a 100 um, or 300 page report from this organization or will you go onto one of these maps and, and see your city and see what uh, their report has to say about it and maybe compare it to other cities, right? So there's other ways to use this information. And so I, I too want to take another detour um, and think about this quote. Uh, the Western industrial scientific approach values the orderly, rational, quantifiable, predictable, abstract, and theoretical, and feminism spat in its eye. Um, and so this quote was kind of saying, like, you, you, those biases um, exist um, out there. And so the fact that you think that we can quantify our world, that you can take all this information and put it on and have pretty pictures to show us, um, doesn't mean that you're representing the truth anymore. Um, so in this detour, let's look at this. Um, this is from um, the National Cancer Institute, um, the GIS and Science Cancer Control and Population-Based Cancer Research website. Um, and so thinking about this from a post-colonial feminist perspective, what are some issues here? Or are there any? We don't have to create issues where there are none. And you can see they're doing the same thing here with these map stories, right? They're going to present that same information. What's the problem with presenting that information? Knowledge is power, but what if you're not empowering people to make any changes? Right? Is that a, is that a social justice concern if you're putting this information out there? Um, let's say you, you find out you're living in a, in a, a neighborhood that has um, a lot of environmental-based cancers. What can you do with that information? Maybe. Maybe you can't, though. What if, you can't, what if that's not an option? What can you do? And so the question is, when we use these GIS tools, we have to think about what are the implications. It's good that this information is out here, but we can also be critical about um, what are the next steps? What, what needs to happen to not only take that information, but also uh, employ it into action? Um, and so just to think about no research inquiry, whether positivist or indeed humanist or feminist, exists outside the realms of ideology and politics. Research is never value-free, uh, even hard science research. And so this is that feminist perspective that we should always be critical of what we're looking at um, and understand being reflective of our own practices, how our own practices um, portraying um, Western as the norm, right? How are we doing that um, in academia? Uh, so the question is now, like, how do geotechnologies perpetuate the status quo? Um, and then how can they disrupt it? Thoughts to, points to ponder. Um, so let's look at some community mapping projects. I'll look at crisis mapping, uh, citizen science, uh, and community mapping projects. And so these are maybe some ways that um, we're using GIS, GIS tools to disrupt the norm. Um, and so with crisis mapping, uh, in Haiti in 2010, there was a 7.0 magnitude earthquake um, that killed many people and uh, shattered many buildings. Uh, and so there was a great need um, here um, for humanitarian support. Uh, but before we can talk about this story, we have to go back to Kenya in 2008 and its election that was uh, deemed unfair and the protests that um, resulted um, from it. Uh, this woman, Oria Koyo, he, she um, put this, she tweeted out, we really need to have um, uh, maps going on of uh, where the, this different violence is happening. She was a journalist news blogger and she kind of put that tweet out and within a couple days they formed an online uh, mapping project um, uh, called Testimony in Swahili, Bushahidi, and so they started mapping all these protests, right, so people could understand what was going on with this post-election violence. Um, okay, so that started there, and so um, just a couple years later, um, that technology is being used here after the earthquake. Um, so this is um, uh, students at Tufts University um, gathered around their laptops. Uh, they're trying to mine um, text data and tweet data coming from Haiti to um, build resources um, to let people like the U.S. Department of State and the U.S. military know where the needs are. Um, because initially after a disaster, for anyone who's lived in it, right, there's a lot of unknowns uh, at the very beginning, and it's really important to figure out where are the most critical needs. 
Uh, and so they uh, work with the Haitian diaspora, so Haitian immigrants living in the United States and elsewhere, to translate those tweets, to aggregate those tweets, and then build out a map of um, the locations uh, where help was needed. But this combined with another um, effort, you know, they, they got about 60,000 reports um, uh, to help um, these humanitarian efforts. Uh, but the Google Maps that they were starting with were not very good. Um, they had to go in and uh, from satellite uh, imagery, from remotely sensed imagery, um, that was the earthquake, and then the flashes or the amount of edits that happened on the map. So they were using satellite um, um, imagery to map uh, what was there and what was um, broken down. And so they made, um, in a few weeks after the earthquake, they made 1.4 million edits to this um, a digital map, uh, open source, and so this is people around the world doing this. Um, and so it was a combination of not only the people uh, interpreting the tweets, but also the people that making that um, geospatial baseline, that map, um, accurate uh, as a combination. We also have citizen science, and so this is where we're trying to understand the world we live in, and just you can uh, volunteer for citizen science projects. Um, anyone heard this guy before? Sound familiar to anyone? So this is the Arroyo Toad, and um, there's a, an organization called Frog Watch that you can go out and to streams and watersheds and uh, map where you hear this. Um, uh, these species and other um, amphibians and reptiles are indicator spe species for our environment, so when they become endangered, we become endangered. Uh, we could say, and so here's a, um, a screenshot of um, those different reports. So uh, they're finding some species they thought were extinct, they're finding them again, and they're also seeing um, how um, some of these um, species are going away. Um, and so uh, there's a community mapping project in Cairo, um, and so I just think this is a remotely sensed image that I really like. Cairo is, um, you know, right here in the Nile uh, Valley in Egypt. Um, and so uh, citizens went out and talked to people. This is an environmental awareness project, a, a city, a region of 18 million people, uh, he heavily polluted air and water systems. So they took out and did some um, interviews with people and then they presented it um, at different locations in the city uh, to help planners uh, make better uh, decisions and to educate the public. Um, so this is another way we can kind of disrupt the norm when we're actually on the street talking to people and getting their perspectives on important issues like air and water quality. All right, and so um, there was a project in Oregon um, uh, called the Fix This Project, and so trying to encourage more uh, what they call active transportation methods, right, because active transportation could lead to healthier living, um, but that's only if you think these methods are safe. How many of you guys think it would be safe to walk, um, skate, or bike to campus from where you live? Yeah, okay, so it depends on, I know you guys, some of you guys live pretty distant, but the idea here is that they, they created an app that people could use um, to either, like, say, talk about their preferred routes of active transportation or maybe different places where there's a big pothole. Or I know for me, there's, like, one stretch of where I like to bike where it's the on-ramp, which is, like, you know, um, a, a death trap, perhaps. Right, and so you know, someone uh, it could use this app to notify the city planners to say, hey, this is a problem, like if we could just fix this one stretch, we're gonna be able to encourage more people to perceive the environment, that's the psychology of it, to perceive the environment to be safe to take these active transportation routes. So th these are some that I can just email you guys, but I just wanted to mention them. Like if you need an outline map, um, BYU Geography Department has really good sources of maps. Um, the Arizona Geographic Alliance has really good uh, outline maps. They're even more simplified, um, the ones there, because they're made for K-12. Um, but I think those are, are, are better in some ways. Um, and then you can also do custom outline maps um, from Nat Geo Ed Mapping. You can just go there, you can pick a country or a location, a continent, and then customize the information on there, uh, whether you want it to show rivers or not, for example. Um, historical maps, um, how many of you guys have gone to this U University of Texas map library? They really, it's probably the most extensive um, location uh, for maps, both historical and then they also have links to, to current maps as well. Um, and then the New York Public Library recently digitized its map collection and so that's available online and, and theirs is pretty extensive as well. 
Um, and then, so let's think of our departure point. Like, where have we gone today? I think I've emphasized that all maps are distortions, all maps misrepresent reality. Um, and then I think we just compound that when we look at the digital world, right? We haven't, the, the fact that it's on a screen instead of on a 2D piece of paper hasn't changed that. Um, and then, so, you know, we looked at the digital earth. Uh, we looked at some community mapping projects. You know, I just selected a few that I found interesting. Hopefully we can start to take this post-colonial feminist lens. It might not be useful to, to take this approach, but the idea is what, what can we learn from it? How is it different to think about people's lived experiences? How is it different when we think about um, the biases that we have as people living in this part of the world? Um, what is the, the utility of that? Um, and so thinking again, you know, what, is, what does it mean to love maps in the digital age? Does anyone want to finish the sentence? Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. <clears throat> well, I'm a political science major, so I think that what I kind of take from this is that it helps us all kind of be active citizens and helping, you know, show where there's different infrastructure needs, like you're talking about mm -hmm. active transportation. Um, when there's international issues, you know, we can help other people, the least of us who can't really help themselves when we're, you know, standing out of disaster zones. And so, what I think what really makes digital maps cool is that we're all able to kind of be a part of that and, um, you know, help the world as a whole. Yeah, and so a lot of those user-generated maps, like we're disrupting or we're d democratizing the map-making process because you don't need to be a cartographer with specialized skills in order to do it. I mean, hopefully you have some of those basic geography skills to know what you're doing, but the idea is that that information, once you're trained, right, you can, you can make a valuable contribution to our understandings. Yeah, I like that, active citizenship. Yeah. Anyone else want to finish the sentence? Thanks. I feel like in this day and age we value uh, accuracy and you know the things that we teach in school and so I think it, it is important that you know the maps we're showing kids in, in school are accurately represent the way the world actually is. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have a world map in your home? Do you know what projection it is? Is it a Mercator map? I actually have it in my backpack so <laughs> I, don't have it. I do I have a, a three-year-old so I, I've been looking on like Etsy and I see big maps you can actually post on like walls and yeah. then we have like animals and stuff that they can place. But I, what is this one? I don't know. I'll have to, I'll have to look at it. That's looking yeah. like it's a cylinder, probably a Mercator. It's looking like it from here. Um, and that's also not geo -ed mapping too. They have, you can put like, you can make tabletop maps. So you can do like a continental map that's like eight sheets of paper. Or one thing I want to do, I'll just throw out there. They have one that's like maybe 30 sheets by 30 sheets, a world map. And I thought it would be cool if we like each took one and decorated it and then compiled it back again. That's, that's in my brain for another day, but I want to be sure to thank you. I especially want to thank my students who are here that have tortured through several hours of this sort of rambling ideas being put together. Um, so thanks to my students for coming. Thanks to everyone else. I really appreciate it. Um, I can talk about these topics all day. I can explore these topics all day. So thank you for um, entertaining me to do this. So thanks. so much to Waverly Ray and now we have time for um, further questions and I'm sure there will be some and while I have everybody's attention I just want to mention that I completely forgot to say which is very relevant that this uh, event is sponsored co-sponsored by the Women's History Month uh, mm -hmm. which of course is why it's very relevant that there's a, uh, a focus on feminism here so uh, questions my question is actually about the feminist point of view. Why, why do you guys call it that? Because I would think in this day and age, everyone is being very critical of everyone's perspective. Mm -hmm. So why is it considered the feminist? I mean, I think, and, you know, there's some philosophers in the room that I might look to here, but I think, you know, a lot of these movements, uh, the name that we call it now is the name where it was rooted in. So when feminism started, right, that was important that, that it was named that, right? It was situated in a certain time and place. And so I think, you know, now coming out of that, um, you know, it's still part of that. And so you know, there's feminism, post-feminism, right? So there's different, like, components of it historically. Um, I don't know if you guys have, have a agreement on that. I'm not really a feminist scholar. You, you know, yeah. it's not my area. But um, I definitely employ those methods. Yeah. So that's all I can say. 
Understandable. No one sense. else wants to pipe in. Yeah. I was say, what kind of map would you say would be good to show? I like how you brought up your showing my son. your son. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of map do you think would be like kid friendly to show, but it would be accurate and helpful? Yeah, I mean, I think for children, I mean, any any map is a helpful map, right? Um, but um, I think Nat Geo Ed, um, they have a lot of free maps, um, and they, I think they have a tab for families, and so you can click on that tab, and then they have all kinds of different maps and like little video clips that are pretty cool for kids. Um, so I'd recommend there, and I think um, you know, mostly you know, psychology research says like you know, a lot of the biases that are implanted in us happen you know maybe around eighth grade, sixth to ninth grade in that range, and so that's when you want to sit down and maybe talk about the maps that are there and like what's being represented or not re represented, or you know, if there's some I you know issue at school, think about does that have a spatial component that you can show on a map how maybe something is in unjust or you know. I think that's the time, but for very young children, just having a map there is going to help me out when they come into my classroom. Yeah. Yes. How do you feel about like Google Earth as a way to learn about world geography? I mean, I think it's incredible. Um, you know, we we opened up our um, new geography lab with that new SV building, and you know, we used to have to look at stereograms right through these um, binoculars. Basically, it was essentially a magic eye poster with geographic um, imagery on it, right? Because you had to like line up your eyes the right way in order to see the 3D. And now with Google Earth, you just can zoom in, you can fly around, and so our understanding to visualize the planet is pretty incredible. And so I think. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, but we have to also understand, you know, the data, like, you have to look at the data, like, when was the data found, right, um, kind of think about who's creating that information, um, you know, oftentimes people mistake when they're looking at that, like, what the actual colors show, you know, because there might, you know, it's like, why is it that, you know, there's this one rectangle that's that one color, and then the next rectangle over is a different color, and that's in the, in the processing of the imagery, so maybe learning about, you know, how that uh, processing occurs. Right, because the satellite's not just taking like a camera photo, right? There's some, some uh, calculations that are putting that out there. So I think just learning about that. And they call it metadata. Are you guys familiar with that? Sort of whenever you look at a map, like the story maps here, the best story maps have all the information about the metadata of the map, who created it, at what time did, was it created, you know, all, all this information, all that background information that really tells the full story of, of what you're looking at. Yeah. Google Earth is uh, basically GIS, right? Yeah, um, we could you could say that. Um, sometimes they just call it the digital Earth because it's a digital representation. But I think when you go on to get a PhD and take the philosophy of geography, you can kind of work out the fine fine tune differences of that. Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit interested in GIS. I've never taken a GIS course, mm -hmm. uh, but I most likely will. Uh, you know, a couple minutes kind of looking into it all, uh, online. Um, there are several different GIS databases. Mm -hmm. um, do average citizens have access to the GIS databases, or do you have to be like a registered user? How do you gain access to that kind of data? All of the above, and it really kind of depends on um, the types of information that you're looking at. But um, and I think when you take GIS, like. Part of, you know, I would say 30% of the struggle of that class is finding your data um, and then making it fit and work into the system that you're using. And so that's one of the skills that you'll learn. I mean, there's thousands of sources of, of geographic information, really. Um, and so has anyone here taken a GIS class? Would you say that's true, that finding the data when you yeah. do a project? Yeah, that was the hardest part for like our final project. I took an online course, so it was a little different. Uh -huh. um, but for our final project, we had to make a map of you know where we wanted basically, and that was the one thing our professor stressed was finding the data and make sure you do it you know a few weeks beforehand because it takes a while to get what you actually want done. And it's actually, I mean, that's interesting too. So it's like you might have all these questions, but the questions that you have are limited to the data that you have out there. And so, like from a feminist perspective, what is that like? How does that implicate like the questions that people are answering? are um, biased from the, the limitations of the data that we have, right? So we can, just to think about it, but, um, but it's, when it does work, though, it's cool, right? When you find that data, it is still pretty, you know, it's worth it.
Yes, I'd like to get back to um, you were talking for one thing. Uh, you told me that you traveled a lot, and you also mentioned it, it uh, during your talk. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I'm thinking of the the distortions of uh, the classical map of Mercator map. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever been to a place where you could tell that the citizens felt that they were marginalized because of uh, their lack of stature on the, the traditional maps, or did people just go on with their lives and feel that they were in the middle, like most of us always feel? Um, I don't know that I can talk speak to that in terms of like directly from the maps, but I think. Um, when I did start working internationally, it, it kind of did realize, you know, if you are coming from like a, a, a country like Canada, Russia, um, China, or Brazil, or like one of the larger countries, like we do have a different perspective than someone coming from a, a smaller country. Um, and I hadn't really thought about that, and it could, like, and even I remember like a lot, some of my Chileans colleagues like kind of like sort of joking or teasing themselves about like the the long thinness of their country, you know, compared to others. Um, so I, there's probably like psychopsychology geography research about it, but I'm not familiar. But yeah, I think it, it, it rings out. Yeah. I mean, there are obvious examples, of course, in the Middle East, but I'm not going to touch that, you know, in terms of, you know, territorial uh, self-esteem. Uh, but uh, a local example, I think, is in Mexico, it's commonly said, you know, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. <laughs> so there's still that sort of mentality, you know, for, for those people who were I mean, sent back during the Bracero program, for example, in mm -hmm. the 40s and so on. So yeah. it's interesting. I mean, it's a very self-conscious sort of geographical uh, protest. <laughs> yeah, I have a friend from Texas who likes to, you know, he's um, Mexican-American and he likes to tell, you know, his uh, generations of family history in Texas is longer than my family's history as a, a white American, you know, yeah. It's all part of it. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you've traveled a lot, but since you have, are there any like recommendations on how to travel smartly when it comes to like cost? Because I wasn't able to get a passport until I was an adult and decided I was going to go to Europe. But um, I'm having a hard time with having a child and figuring out how I'm going to open these doors for him mm -hmm. with it being so expensive. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there are study abroad programs um, here, and so I think that's a great way. Um, here and other places where you can get credit, and a I think a lot of students don't realize that there are um, scholarships to pay that. You know, if you have a, a job commitment, obviously that's a problem, but I think that study abroad experience is really great. Um, and so to look for those either here at Mesa or at um, your transfer institutions. Because um, there's, you know, that's the best experience. You know, t being an armchair geographer is fine, right? It's comfortable. You're not, but you're not really challenged until you have to leave mm -hmm. your comfort zone. Um, so I would recommend study abroad. And then, um, other than that, um, you know, people ask. You know, I, I was really lucky in, in being able to travel, but you know, I didn't have a smartphone for the longest time, and I felt like that was money I was like saving for the next trip. You know, and just like. Um, thinking about like what could you possibly cut out in your income to see like to save that money because it, it does cost and it is a privilege to be able to do that um, but I, I think it's worth it um, and so but I don't yeah I think there's probably like a bunch of blogs that could say these things better than I could um, but definitely hostels have you would you get would you stay in a hostel or? well I mean I, I pretty much um, I worked with a travel agent when I was in Europe and he was pretty much like stay in three star or or like just stay in a three star because other than that you'll have a communal bathroom so I stay away from hostels mm -hmm. but um, even finding three stars is pretty simple of a uh, hole in the wall they're still pretty yeah, and they have, I mean, they have, like, couch surfing, too. Um, I know people that have done that. I had couch surfers stay when I lived in Texas. I, um, I don't even remember where they were from. Somewhere in Europe, and, um, you know, so that's a possibility. Uh, and then also Airbnb. we live in, yeah, Airbnb. Yeah. Like, we also live in San Diego, so you can do, like, um, uh, housing swaps, right? Anyway, yeah. people want to come here. Mm -hmm. So just put, your, put your, your apartment out there. You never know. I'm not liable for anything that happens, right? Mm -hmm. You asked us if we love maps. I happen to love maps. And I, I always love maps, and I love traveling in them and imagining things and so forth. Uh, and it was a huge surprise to me the first time I found out that there are people who cannot read maps. Uh, they are, and it's this, not dyslexic, but this, this part, some sort. Um, have, do you have, as a geographer, do you have an explanation? Do you have a, a way for people to actually be able to relate to maps? Uh, if, if you, if you find that, that some students 
just you know, don't relate to maps. Well, I mean, like any of our innate skills, like there's a range of um, you know abilities, capabilities, um, and so it's the same with spatial thinking skills. But I think, you know, um, it's not that they can't read maps; it's that that they've never had to. Um, and so, uh, you know, and it's even like in my classes, like students, you know, it's like you have to tell them, like w when you look at a map, what is the first thing you do? You read the title. Like some people, like you're already looking at the information, but have you read the title? Have you seen what's been focused on? And then you read the legend, you know, and so you find out that. Maybe you see what projection it is, you know, and so I think it's not that people can't do it. Um, I think it's that people haven't been trained to utilize those spatial thinking skills. Um, but it's the same with me. I mean, you know, I am, and there's some gender differences here too, although the, the research is kind of uncertain. But I still, like if I'm reading a map, I still want to orientate myself towards the way the map is. You know, I'm a geographer, and I've got three geography degrees, friends, and so, um, you know, that's, how, that's telling you about, like, I've, I've reached the limit of my spatial thinking skills, you know, but I can read the map once I've done that, you know, um, but I have a terrible sense of direction. Uh, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think that'll change, um, but I do know how to read a map, so it doesn't matter, like, that I'm, I'm lost like that, but I, um, but of course I have to be hopeful because if I thought there's some people that just couldn't read maps, like, what would I do with my students, you know, like, I have to think everyone has this ability. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, I mean, that's fascinating to me. I mean, we all know what it means for someone that's not able to read, right? That's more of an established, you know, deficiency, and there are a lot of reasons why. But what does it mean to not be able to read a map? I mean, assuming that I mean, if someone doesn't have some, some sort of impairment or, or challenge, but just, you know, an average person who can, can read, you know, in the literary sense, what does it mean to not be able to read a map? What does that mean? Yeah. So I mean, I mean, I can understand some people have more facility, mm -hmm. right? But what does that mean? Yeah. Or to even like rely totally on the GPS to get where you're going, like when your battery dies, or, like are you going to be lost? Like what are you going to? What happens? That floors me. I mean, I, I sort of get it on paper, but I mean, if you were to take someone, 23 year old, you know, perfectly smart, but has a block or whatever, and let's say, oh, I don't read maps. In fact, Scott was just telling me that he knew someone. But what does that mean? What's going on, you know, in their in their <laughs> noggin? <laughs> I, I, I think we may have uh, a noggin who might want to respond noggin. here. That's that's <laughs> actually how how my brain works. Uh, I I've worked with maps before. I've been taught how to use a map, but when it comes down to it, and I'm in the middle of a city and I have to look at a map, I'm like. Google Maps is so much easier because it gets rid of all the extra lines because I have a hard time focusing in on certain things. So if I'm looking for one particular street, I'm like, well, can we just get there? Mm -hmm. Our generations have gotten really um, spoiled with all of our smartphones and all of our GPSs and all of this technology that we don't learn to really use the map as a whole, we just look for this specific line and everything else is just null and void. Nothing else is necessary except for exactly point A to point B. You're not even seeing the map, you're just driving and listening to it. So yeah. you don't, and you're only listening to it, you're not even hardly paying attention to what's going on around you, so you're not seeing. So for the most part, doing these, like the, the drawing thing, I've only lived in San Diego for six months, so I don't have a whole lot of the idea of where things are because I still get lost and I still have to turn on my GPS every now and then but when I don't have it on it's just like what she was saying earlier you just tunnel vision where you're going you don't pay attention to all the other side streets that's a couple of hands back here Go ahead, I think that means like uh, devices like reading the map for you not just you are reading the map there, there is a uh, technology that can um, provide you the information like right away. Just, and I think that's like it's up to the person who has the ability to just like to read the uh, spatial perceptions mm -hmm. and steps. And just, yeah, it, it's like you know some some people can uh, just visualize the you know math graphics graphs the kind of steps. Mm -hmm. and, it's more about like biological facts than you know. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's a range. I, and I saw your hand and then your hand, okay. Got it, sir? Oh, um, sorry, yeah. When you use Google um, directions, it doesn't seem to me that, that you're really reading a map or using a map. You're, you're just more like, it's like a friend telling you how to get there. So it's not really using a map. Now, um, one of the things I tell people all the time, because um, I, I used to teach people how to read maps in the military, mm -hmm. and, and we used to have, you know, people that that been eight, in eight years, adults that were like anywhere from 24 to 30 years years old. They 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 failed. They like that was a career breaker because they couldn't read maps. You know, they've done all this training up to that point, mm -hmm. uh, and and it, there wasn't that many. But I always tell people, uh, you gotta read. You're, you can't just rely on that because there's all kinds of crazy out stuff out there and you might be driving into some some it might take you like twice as long so you gotta you gotta actually look where you're going and and make sure that that path that you're taking is is the most accurate path a lot of times you might be driving with me and 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 you might hear that it's telling you to go left I go no I'm going this way because I actually read the map and that's reading yeah. a, that's reading a map to me that's not listening to two directions Right. There's always those stories of like people who drive into ponds because they were following the directions on GPS. <laughs> There's little glitches in there if, if you if if you actually if you actually knew what you're if a lot of times you followed the map as as it was being uh, as as it was progressing. There's there's pockets of uh, of delay, so it's like very un unreliable. Do you have a comment? Yeah, going back to what he was saying, as an individual, I don't read maps. Um, it's going to be a couple things for me, I feel like. It's going to be a generational thing, mm -hmm. and it's also going to be a brain retention. So, my grandma is always saying, like, especially when I moved to San Diego, get lost. Like, mm -hmm. don't rely on the tools that you have. Just go and get lost. I say, I don't have time for that. What's the address? And then also, um, brain retention. I, in elementary school, we did the maps. I'm now in Geography 101, and I'm still doing the maps, and I'm like, I am still not retaining where certain places are. To this day, I don't know how to use a compass, but in elementary school, we were taught how to use a compass. I don't understand it. It like does not click in my brain, but I do love to travel, but I don't know how to use a map, so. It's really bad. And I think I think we're kind of like mixing up a couple of different ideas of like my geography education colleagues would talk about like we're talking about like using maps for wayfinding, mm -hmm. right, which is separate from other ways that we read and interpret maps. You know what I mean? So when I hear you say like I can't read a map, like I'm sure there are maps that are not that cluttered that are very beautiful that can be read. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like and, and so that's like one thing to like a map that tells a story or gives you information. But then the wayfinding thing, it's like we're complicating it because, you know, you changing your direction in space, that's a whole other skill. And then the ability of the map maker to give you the information is different. Um, you know, so it's like, like there's, these are different issues that geographers would want to focus on. I mean, I'll stay here all afternoon, but I, I really feel like you guys were super troopers, and I appreciate, I appreciate it. Okay. Yes. Basically, the comments idea of the younger generation concerning maps is similar to the comments I, I heard when I first started teaching, and we teach math classes, very few people. Then, when they had calculators, yes, they knew how to use the calculators, but they, they had no idea how to use the map. Uh, oh, sorry, how to do the math. Yeah, people know how to use uh, the Google Earth and that, but they can't read a map. Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing the same thing that I heard 20, 25 years ago when I taught math classes. They said, oh yeah, you need a calculator. You know, I'll work it all out. Mm -hmm. I said, no, do it in pencil and paper. I can't do it. <laughs> I wonder what's going to be the next one in the next 30 years. Uh, I think it's also that people don't know how to, how to um, use a map as they travel. Because uh, a lot of times I know how to read a map, but you need someone to drive and pay attention all the time, and someone to give you directions, mm -hmm. or vice versa. And I think uh, I think just even setting up that process, uh, just knowing how, how to actually utilize the map effectively, if you have a group of people, mm -hmm. instead of that one person trying to do everything, and that's why they're, they're probably like messed up because they're they're not they're not uh, separate, separate relying on someone else to to give them that direction. Same when I when I first came here, I, I was I grew up on on. Eastern coast, easterly coast, 
And uh, I've never had a problem looking at a map. When I was, I love them. Oh, but the first couple of years, I had a hard time telling north from south here because the ocean is always was always to the east. Uh, and that meant that when I was driving along the coast, then if I was driving north, I thought instinct. But my instinct told me that I was going south because that was where the ocean was. So, That's true for people who come from the east coast. I, would, I, would exactly I had the same the problem, problem when I moved there. <laughs> yeah. um, I kept thinking, oh yeah. The ocean's to the east, and I've got to know, and it took me a few years to get used to that. Yeah. So it's not just Europeans. <laughs> My mom had the same problem. She lived in Washington State, so she always had, you know, the mountains over here and the ocean over here. So she never had a problem. And then she moved to Texas, and she's like, there's nothing. I have no sense of direction at all. Because where we lived in Texas, we don't have mountains. We don't have the water, we don't have rivers, it's just plains and cities. So she's like, I give up, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I think Nina helped me out uh, in that I, I realize I'm in touch with my feminine side because that's the only way I navigate in terms of landmarks. <laughs> so personal uh -huh. confession, uh, I still have, well I've been here a handful of years, I'm not from there, but Balboa and Claremont, Mesa, and those streets, like there's a Thai restaurant I go to, and there are no natural landmarks, so it's so easy to drop the ball. There's no, I mean, the cathedral or park. I mean, admittedly, that's a, you know, worst case scenario, but I'm always getting confused. They're all the same to me because it's, it has to do with, you know, change. It's a 76 gas station and a, you know, a Ross and a KFC, right? And it's just, <laughs> There's, there's nothing that's distinct or gives you, you know, a clue where, I, I, you know, obviously Boston or San Francisco or European cities, I mean, you have, you, you, you know everything by landmarks. And so your mental map is much more clean. Yeah. But when you get into that la-la land, right, I have no, no idea where in the hell I am when I'm in that, I don't know what that area is called, is it Claremont Mesa? I'm not exactly sure what you're thinking Except of. for Convoy, right? But because I know the Asian restaurants there that I go to. That's a great example of what a geographer would call a placeless landscape. It's like there's nothing distinct about it. And in fact, it could be like found, that type of landscape could be found in other places in the country, right? Where it's just a 76, a Ross, and so, you know, like, yeah, you and a Thai this, restaurant. Like all that. the way to Temecula, and it just repeats itself, that <laughs> pattern, right? Every four miles, it's like, wait a minute, where am I now? Yeah. <laughs> Just to amplify his point, um, I actually have an excellent sense of direction and I never get lost until I went to Barcelona where all of the uh, buildings are about six stories tall. It was nighttime. I could not find out where things were and I didn't have a light to read a map. Right? And I was, for the first time in my life, lost, really lost. Well, geographers say we don't get lost, we explore. <laughs> so we can clarify that, but that's me. That's me every day trying to find something. So um, yeah. Well, on that note, it's a good one. <laughs> thank you. That's All right, good. thank you. So much better than I expected.